Hey everybody! Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today we have um, today we have Wilbur Roger. He's a veteran composer in the video game industry. Uh, he joined Lucas Arts back in two thousand eight, and since he's worked on some amazing projects: Star Wars, The Old Republic. Uh, he scored Mortal Kombat eleven, Call of Duty, uh, World War Two, uh, the Emmy Award winning Star Wars: Vader Immortal, <laughs> Guild Wars, Path of Fire. Uh, so many games. He's such a, a, a in-demand composer uh, in the video game industry. Um, he's a member of the Game Audio Network Guild, and um, we're so excited to, to have him with here today to, to speak with our students. Will, how's it going over there? I'm great, man. Thanks a bunch. And again, thanks everyone for having me. It's always a pleasure to, to hang out with the SFCM students. Cool. So um, I suppose today you are going to talk to us a little bit about your workflows in Reaper, which a lot of our, our students have started to uh, deep dive into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so um, I will start off by explaining um, why I use Reaper and uh, a little bit about how I made the transition. Um, I was originally a Cakewalk Sonar user for years and years and years. Um, and the transition into Reaper was not easy, uh, but I, I did it and uh, for good reason that I'll get into. After that, I'll talk about my template. Um, by the way, everything is is, you can see the screen here, right? Like this is working the, okay, perfect. And uh, just to make sure you can hear, can we hear sound? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so uh, why Reaper? Well, I was um, working at LucasArts as a music editor and I needed something to, you know, do edits very quickly. And I figured there's like no way in hell that they're gonna let me install Sonar on these computers. Uh, but I had an assignment that I had to do like now. And they were like, here's logic, do music editing and logic, which is like the most painful thing you can possibly imagine. So um, I heard about this Reaper thing. I knew it used a similar um, uh, workflow to Sony Vegas, the video editor, which I was already used to. Um, so I used it and it was great. And it immediately clicked. Um, it's super easy and fast to do any kind of audio editing. Uh, and so at first it was its audio editing capability uh, that attracted me to it. And what I mean by that is that uh, you can just so quickly, you know, chop files up. You can, uh, like I was showing earlier, you can quickly add, I apologize, uh, <laughs> Mr. Schultz, I'm going to ruin your music real quick, but like, you know, you can add uh, pitch no worries, or anything. Will. I could even draw it in if I wanted to. I mean, it's it's super fast. You can have uh, volume envelopes as well, and this is on the clip level too, which immediately are reflected in the waveform, which is such a great tool for uh, so many different types of sound design and uh, sample editing as well. Uh, you can have effects on the clip as well, so. You have your effects on a, a track, but you can also put effects on individual clips and automate them within the clip. And then as you split the clip, it's now got a copy of that. I mean, it, the list goes on and on. And then you've got like the next folders, um, which are not working because I'm hyperactive. There you go. Like, yeah, you can nest it folders and then you can have folders in folders. It's got a completely agnostic way of working with uh, any kind of track you throw at it. I could throw MIDI into this track and it'll be like, cool, you have MIDI, great. And it just works. Uh, I can throw in, this is a 44 kilohertz project file. This is a 48 kilohertz uh, sound and it doesn't care. It just deals with it. Uh, I could throw video in here too. I won't because I don't want to you know, test the waters or whatever because uh, Torrent is forcing me to use direct sound instead of ASIO. And so uh, I don't want to test anything at all actually right now. But it all works very seamlessly. Um, and so that was like the first level of why I liked using the switch. The second level was that uh, the CPU usage is better than anything else out there by far. Um, it's ridiculously efficient. You can load a bajillion plugins and it just treats it like it's nothing. Um, I, I hesitate to even think about what some of my more demanding recent uh, project files would look like in any other DAW, even if you have one of those like Hollywood render farms with like a million PCs. I only have one PC that I put everything on. 
I don't bother with VE Pro or anything. It's just the one PC uh, running all of my everything. Uh, and I never really needed to do the whole render farm or anything like that. Because uh, Reaper is so efficient that it's it just chugs right along. Um, uh, the next level of it was that, um, I, I mean, this is this is probably what's talked about the most, which is that it's very customizable. Um, like I was showing earlier, I have this uh, color theme, but it's only like this and kind of ugly because I'm very colorblind. And so this is the only one that I can actually like see. But if you wanted something else, then you can just easily change it. Oh, that's way worse. Ah, ha <laughs> ha. Bad move. Good job. Let's try this. Okay. Yeah. You can easily change it to anything else. Um, you can download a color theme in, in seconds. And then as soon as you double click it, bam, Reaper's already changed. You don't even have to go into preferences or anything. It's that fast and, and that cool. Um, and then within each theme, you can change different layouts if you want. You can have all kinds of, oh, that's weird. All kinds of weird, uh, all kinds of different customization options for the windows. Um, sorry, let me just go back to my original one because I can't even see. There we go. Um, sorry, just one sec. Oops. Come on. Mm. This one, there we go. Uh, let's go back to a new. So the way I have it set up uh, is kind of custom. Uh, I like let me check this out again. There we go. I like being able to see kind of like how you have in Pro Tools, or you have like the I forget what they call it, but like you can say like here's my main tracks or whatever. Well, because I have my tracks listed uh, as nested folders with um, naming conventions, I can see all of my major uh, orchestral groups just by typing FOL for folder. And now if I want to solo out the wind section, I can easily do that. I can solo out the mass, you know, anything I want to do, um, mute them, hide them, whatever you want, I can do in this little area here. Uh, I even have other naming conventions, maybe not in this project file, but in others where it's like, if I want to just see all of my VIs, I can see that there. Um, so it makes it really easy to do the and like no one else's Reaper does that necessarily. Uh, it's just something that I started doing and I can. And everyone can customize Reaper however they want. I have my own custom buttons here. Like uh, for example, say I'm working in um, contact and I've decided that I want to render a bunch of uh, MIDI to audio. Well, you can do that with like freezing the track, right? But that doesn't actually work if you're using a 16 channels of MIDI type plugin, because no matter what the program, it's not going to know like, well, what, where does this go? Um, because it's not aware of that audio. The only way to do that is you have 16 audio outputs. But uh, what I've done is I've just simply made a render track, which is actually just a track template that takes in external audio and treats it like an input. Uh, and if this crashes, then blame Torin. But yeah, see, now it's it's recording that as if it were an external input. And then I can use this clip wherever I want. Um, and I made a button for it. So now I don't have to even think about that setup. I just click the button, that thing comes up, I record, bam. And I do, I've, I do so much processing like that, um, especially on like Mortal Kombat and one of my uh, current scores, uh, there's a lot of processing of orchestral sounds. Um, sometimes I'll even put effects on the entire orchestral mix and crossfade from a natural orchestra to this weird phasery, spinny kind of vibe thing. Um, so Reaper makes it super easy to do any of those kinds of operations. Uh, and similarly, we've got this actions window where if ever you're let's say you're new to reaper and you're like i wish i knew how to do this thing you just press the question mark and then this action window comes up and then you can type in i don't know like edits you know whatever 
and now you have all of the editing stuff or like you know clip or something and now you have everything that has to do with that you can just type in any search and you can probably find within seconds whatever it is you're looking for i have a personal policy of whenever people ask me reaper questions i don't answer them for at least two and a half minutes because chances are by the time that I've typed in a response, they've figured out how to freaking do it on their own. And that happens so much that I just don't even, you know, I, I just give it some time. They'll work it out either here or, um, and this is something that honestly, every program in existence should implement. There's a search function in the preferences view. Mm. So if I have something that I don't like that Reaper keeps doing, I can just look for it in here like maybe I don't like these peaks. Like why are they showing up in this, you know, whatever? Well, I just do a find and it looks for every time that uh, I have the word peaks in the preferences. And I can just, you know, figure out on my own what's going on and how to change it. And then lastly, and this is what a lot of people talk about is like the whole scripting engine and all that. There's two kinds of scripting in Reaper. This is not super important, but it's just something to know. Um, where is it? Uh, console. So one is like, yeah, okay, you have this console. I don't use it. I don't even know what it's for. But this is like, if you want to come up with all kinds of weird, crazy stuff you can make Reaper do, there's that. There's Lua scripting. And uh, if you want to see some stuff that that does, like people have been making these Lua scripts uh, for Reaper and they upload them to this one central repository and uh, everyone has access to all of them. It's all free open source and you can see it all right here. So, uh, and, and these are, these are crazy kind of scripts that people have created. People have made ones where like you can, I don't want to mess this up because this is my actual project file, but like, there's ones where you can make track tags to like hide and show entire you know groups of tracks. So it's like an easier way to do screen sets. Um, that's the only one that I use currently. Oh, actually, no, there's another one I use. So like normally if you want to, and this is just an example of the kind of shit that people do. Normally if I want to add an effect, right? I got to go here and then this window pops up and then it's like, oh, add this effect. Okay, cool. Um, let me choose something small. Set a compressor, bam. And that's like, you know, how many clicks was that? Like three, four, something like that. Uh, you don't have to do that at all anymore. Now I can just boop, boop, done. I have a hotkey and it just comes up with this list. And the list is populated in, in order of um, frequency. So if I'm constantly using re-EQ, which is like the Reaper's native EQ, uh, it'll just show up at the top of the list and Remember when I said that you can put effects on clips as well as tracks? If you hold control and click that, now this EQ is on this clip right here. Um, so it's these all a bunch of little things that you know are just super useful that you can do um, in Reaper that save tons and tons and tons of time. And uh, that's I think why people who are gravitating towards it, especially in sound design. Sound design in games is massively flocking towards Reaper. Um, I mean, the the folks at Sledgehammer are all using it, NetherRealm. Uh, I was just talking with some folks, uh, I forget which studio, somewhere in England, but they're all using it too. Um, Sony PlayStation in England as well, uh, Sony London. And uh, yeah, it's it's massively powerful, very fast, very easy, very lightweight. The whole install is like 20 megabytes or something ridiculous like that. I mean, it's preposterous. You can run it off of a flash drive. Um, anyway, enough about that. Um, I want to talk about my own template and how that works. Um, before I move on to that, are there any more like general Reaper questions that anyone has? What are your thoughts on Nuendo versus Reaper? Nuendo, you know, I'm not um, super familiar with Nuendo. I mean, Cubase to me was like a different sonar. 
and I love Sonar. I really like Sonar's uh, piano roll view. Um, I like Sonar's piano roll view a lot more than Reaper's. How's that for honesty? But uh, Reaper 6, they've improved it quite a bit. Um, so it's a little a little better now. But um, Nuendo, it's, you know, it's it's great. Uh, I don't really have any anything to say as far as, like, how it compares. I will say that Cubase and Nuendo users, um, the first thing that they take issue with in Reaper is that there isn't, like, a multi-tool in Reaper. There's only, like, the one cursor, right? And so every time, you know, a, a Cubase user comes over to Reaper, they're like, hey, where's the tools? Why don't I, you know? And it's just like, oh, it's slow down. We have different things like hotkeys for things like splitting and fading in and all that kind of thing. Uh, like if I want to fade in until the cursor, I'll just press a button and then it just does it or fade out as well. Uh, or splitting, you just press another button. Uh, so it's not about um, having to select another tool to do that. But instead, it's just simply the hotkeys. And the hotkeys are all things you can create yourself, um, which I find super, super useful uh, because different people have different needs. And uh, it's much better, in my opinion, to have it be very user customizable rather than um, just imposing something. Also, Reaper costs like $400 less. So, I mean, you know, maybe spend your money on sample libraries and reverbs rather than the DAW. Um, Can but, you talk yeah. about how you move your projects around? Well, like once you're done and working with studios, you might be using different software or workflows. You know, um, honestly, 90, not really 100% of the time, studios are going to use Pro Tools to record. And uh, the nice thing about Pro Tools is its users because they are generally really good at keeping very clean project files where the file names are really easy to interpret. Um, what I'm getting at is that I've never really needed to import Pro Tools or even use Pro Tools here because the file names were so easy to parse that I would just load them loose into Reaper. So I mixed my own music from uh, Destiny 2 and that was like a full orchestra recording. Um, and obviously many, many takes and, and um, uh, stripes and whatnot. Uh, but I could, all, I could just work it all out what the things were and then I reassembled it piece by piece in Reaper. And it really didn't take that long at all. Um, I mean, would I wanna do that for like a full score? Probably not, but um, for like the 20, 30 minutes I wrote for Destiny, it was really no, not an issue. Um, to just rebuild it from scratch. I wouldn't trust any of these like uh, project file converter programs that I suppose exist, but um, it's kind of like, who knows what they'll come up with. Uh, I, I personally have never needed anything like that. Um, got, any other Reaper um, questions or? Yeah, is there anything that you would say, I know you mentioned the piano roll view in uh, Cubase. Is there anything that you say like Reaper is weaker at than some other DAWs? Um, and that, like, what are the downsides to Reaper, I guess? Um, the main downside, I think, is the piano roll. But with the disclaimer that they've improved it for version 6, and I'm still using version 5 because I'm on a couple projects still and so I didn't want to upgrade. Um, but I think that's the main shortcoming. Uh, part of the reason why I moved to Reaper in the first place, though, is that I hate uh, MIDI with all my heart and soul. And I wanted to work more with uh, audio as much as possible. And Reaper facilitates that incredibly well. Um, and I wanted to work more with like playing things and performing things in rather than like click, click, click with a mouse. And um, you know, Reaper greatly discourages that by being terrible. Uh, whereas, you know, if I were still in Sonar, then I'd probably still be doing that. And, you know, whereas Reaper, it's so easy to just play things in and edit a little bit and then move on. Um, the other thing that bothers some people, but definitely does not bother me at all, is that because it's so geared towards lightweight installation, Reaper is only like 20, 40 something megabytes or whatever. Um, there's no... Uh, native, well, there's very few native plugins. There's no samples. You get basically just the DAW 
when you buy Reaper. You're not getting a bunch of free shit, right? Um, I think Logic is the best as far as getting a bunch of like stuff when you buy the program, but it's always like seven out of ten, eight out of ten if if you're being generous, and you're inevitably going to replace it with much better professional samples and and plugins and whatnot anyway, uh, that are more geared to your actual style of music. So I don't. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like Reaper is, uh, it has the approach that I prefer, which is to give you the bare minimum. And the plugins it does give you are actually quite good. They don't have pretty UIs, but uh, you do get like some EQs and compressors, gates, like the standard stuff. There's like a reverb in there and stuff. Um, but it's not pretty. And some people that, that bothers them. So, you know. Same with the UI. I mean, I, I, I showed like a better looking UI than this like colorblindness one that I use. But uh, for most people, you know, the UI kind of gets them down because it's not like the flashiest, prettiest thing in the world. And I, I understand that. Um, but other than that, honestly, it's it's pretty great. Like it, the one of the downsides used to be that not a lot of people use it, but especially now that it's making so much headway in video games. Um, you're getting a lot of power users. Um, people like Steven Schapler over at uh, NetherRealm Studios are constantly sharing their workflows, uh, which are much more advanced than mine. Mine is very basic compared to what the crazy stuff that people are doing with, with Reaper nowadays. I mean, it's out of this world. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Or um, I have a question about, uh, do you think you could like foresee this becoming like catching on into the recording industry too? Because um, I've looked at like the recording settings and routing and stuff in Reaper, and it looks pretty friendly. Like I know that's an appeal. I'm not a huge Pro Tools fan, but I know that's an appeal to me for mixing wise, and just recording that the routing is so nice in Pro Tools. And I noticed that it's also actually like really nice in Reaper. Um, yeah. Is, could that be like? Do you think becoming an industry standard next to Pro Tools Reaper, if it's starting to become an industry standard towards... Um, it's like definitely starting. I mean, like, uh, especially with certain genres, like uh, metal, all the metal heads are in Reaper now for some some reason. <laughs> I don't really understand how we got all of them, but come on in, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, all the, all the dudes with like the 40-year-old ponytails, they're all using Reaper. Um, and then lots of sound designers as well. Big studios with like the huge, you know, Avid, whatever, and like the $20,000 version of Pro Tools. Yeah, they're not going anywhere and that's fine. But um, as far as smaller studios and like home recording and all that kind of stuff, Reaper is really taking off. And especially with like, like I said, uh, metal for some reason. Um, but uh, as far as becoming industry standard, I think that it's important to remember why Pro Tools is industry standard. It's that, you know, there is a time when we didn't have the concept of a DAW and Pro Tools shows up and they're like, hey, you don't have to physically cut up tape anymore. Here's this. And uh, it's, it's stuck around for quite some time because of that. Um, I don't really foresee it going anywhere necessarily. Uh, however, what I do foresee, and which has very recently come true, is Pro, or, yeah, Pro Tools seeing the kinds of advantages that Reaper has and, and very slowly adopting some of these things. Um, and I think just recently it had some, some concept of track folders. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it goes with that. But uh, it's slowly adopting some of these Reaper advancements. And I, I really appreciate that they're still, still trying, you know, still trying to keep keep current because uh, it's not easy with something as big as Pro Tools. Um, so definitely props to them for that. Anyone else or? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, sure. You, and you may get into this when going through like your template, but how are you handling like articulations and things like that? With sample oh, that's a very good question. So I do not use key switches. I know that's contentious. I, half the people out there, especially the Hollywood people, are like, no, you must use key switches or else the fire Satan will rain dust. The reason I don't is because, um, let's say, okay, let's find like an action piece. There's not a lot of them in this score. This is the score to a game called A New The Distant Light. Um, 
if you ever get bored of me talking, you can just go there and check it out. So like, oftentimes you're trying to, oh, you know what? Let's, let's find the, okay. So like you're doing a really speedy strings line, right? You can't just have the legato patch because it's not going to be fast enough, right? Uh, and if you have like just a bunch of staccatos, it's not going to connect. So what do you do? Well, sometimes you just have to layer lots of different things and, and layer them differently, maybe record them separately. So like, Um, this is not going to play. <laughs> it's, it's like direct sound is not, uh, not cutting it right now, but you, you can see generally the, the gist of it. Like this is not going to work. If I were just to use the slurs, it would not quite, not quite there. But if I layer them together, So, you know, it's a little, a little bit more uh, seamless and more nuanced. Um, so that's why I don't use key switches because you wouldn't really be able to do that uh, if you're only, if you're restricted to just one, um, one sound at a time. Have you ever considered using like a, a hybrid approach? Um, so like the way that I have it, I, I use Cubase, um, but the way that I do it is I have one track, like one main track that's got the expression map, which is, you know, essentially key switches. Um, to control all the, all the articulations. And then at the bottom of each section, I have an articulations folder with MIDI tracks that mm. route into contact. And then within contact, every articulation is it's on its own channel. So if I want to layer yeah. articulations, then I've got like multiple MIDI tracks that I can do that with, but then I still have the individual track that has all the articulations on one. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, is that's... That, is that something that you can do in Reaper or is that not? Well, what what would stop you from doing that? I mean, it sounds like, you know, maybe you have like track one is the um, the key switch master track or whatever, and then tracks two through sixteen are all the individual articulations. Uh, you could totally do that, and it's it's all that's all you've only used like one instance of contact. Um, you could even do separate instances of contact for every single thing, which I know some people do for whatever reason. Um, anything is fair game. It's all it's all doable. Uh, you could even I think there's a way, and I think some people have like already created like a repack um, repository for this, where like you can select the articulations through like a, like just like a button or something, and you just go boop, and then there it is. Um, I know that in FL Studio, there's like a way that you can have the articulation be chosen through the color of the MIDI note. Yeah, that's uh, using um, an external plugin called BRSO Articulate. Yeah, it yeah, uses yeah. Uses FL Studio's like native color changing in the piano roll to send on MIDI, different MIDI channels. It's just super cool. I mean, that's that's super clever. Um, but yeah, I mean, like since I'm a little bit of a control freak, I I do kind of prefer to do it like this. Um, the other thing that I'll probably get into later is that I don't really um, start off in Reaper. I always sketch on paper first. And so I don't really necessarily need a, a master track for like sketching things. And then I do details on different tracks uh, because it's, you know, the sketch is kind of already done by the time I've loaded up uh, Reaper. Um, but yeah, I mean, something like that is definitely a great idea if you want to like just sit there and like really play around with uh, like, say like the string section. Um, and and have like a sketch version of the string section before you go in and, and put the details. That's actually a really, really cool um, uh, workflow. Template time? Okay, template time. So uh, well let me let me grab a track from somewhere. What do I want to let's see here. Uh, no, actually I showed this last time. Have I written any good music for this game? Probably not. <laughs> Did I say that aloud? <laughs> All right, let me, let me, uh, something that I've done recently. Let's, uh, okay, I'll, I'll play this. 
uh, or does this not have orchestration? I'm sorry, like I didn't really, uh, you can tell that I'm a working composer because I did absolutely no preparation for this whatsoever. And I apologize, I, I should do better. Um, but you know, once again, how's that for honesty? Okay, uh, well, I'll play this intro and then I'll play the main track. So at this point in the game, uh, you find uh, a cave that you fall into and you realize that you are in an alien planet and you've just landed and whatnot and it's all scary and oh no but you've just found liquid water which is like okay we're getting somewhere uh, so that's this It's a, a steel drum recorded by my friend Doug. And uh, yeah, so my project files have a couple different components, but I'll uh, start with the orchestra. So the orchestra is all in score order, as you can kind of see here. So I have the winds up top and then brass and everything else, and then uh, strings. Uh, the way that this is all oriented is I have one, or well, I try to have just one contact instance for each section. Now, obviously, I, I kind of need more than that, but um, I try to keep it as uh, compact and only load the things that I know that I'm going to use. And then I'll leave a couple slots empty um, on a case by cases, case by case, case by case basis for uh, individual scores. Uh, if I feel like I need to, you know, have a signature instrument or something like that. Um, I use Spitfire Albion for most of the wind sections. And uh, the rest of these solos are 8 Dio and uh, Vienna Symphonic. And then there's some Hollywood winds as well for the various runs and drills and stuff. Uh, brass is complicated, so I'll come back to that. Uh, but the percussion is mostly um, Cine Samples uh, Cinefer, uh, because I really love Dennis Sand's approach to recording, and MGM stage is my favorite stage in America, and that's where they recorded this. Uh, and then some other random percussion stuff from all kinds of different places. And then a bunch of live percussion, which I'll explain later on. Uh, this extra folder is just for other instruments that don't fit into the orchestral category. Same with the synth folder. 
And then the strings are all uh, Hollywood, East-West Hollywood strings, uh, diamond version. Um, diamond version is important to me because I like to use the main microphones and the close microphones as well and uh, have them going to different outputs um, so that I can kind of process them a little differently. It looks like I have a, oh, how about that? I didn't know I did that. Interesting. Uh, but anyways, yeah, they're all running through uh, reverb and I'll discuss reverb in a little bit as well. Um, and then finally, I have another little sidetrack of contact stuff for if there's like some string effects or some other thing, uh, it's got its own little extra folder. Solos go in there as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the basic layout of uh, how all this works. Um, there's a theory behind my whole template. I worked on a score called Star Wars First Assault back in 20. 11 through 2013 and we recorded with the london symphony orchestra at abbey road um abbey road had most of my favorite uh playstation 3 era scores recorded there and so i decided okay well i'm building a template now uh why don't i base my template on the sound of the london symphony at abbey road since it's intimately familiar with me i've recorded a score there uh, Killzone was done there, L.A. Noir, Heavy Rain, so many great scores that I really loved back then. So I had a, se a sense of uh, how each instrument sounded. And so the way I built my template was I went to every single instrument in the orchestra and I said, okay, imagine you are a recording engineer. What can you do to these instruments to make the mix sound better? All they can do is turn up the close mics or the sectional mics, but that's it. That's all they can do. If a trumpet is super loud in the deca tree, then guess what? It's super loud in the deca tree and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so I took that philosophy and I said, okay, well, why don't I, oh, if you're not familiar, deca tree is like the distant microphones that are like behind the conductor. It's like three mics kind of thing. Like. So um, I decided, well, why don't I orient my entire synth orchestra that same way with those same uh, restrictions that you would have with a live group. And so I said, okay, well, let me set all of the volumes, uh, or I'm sorry, let me set all of the reverb sends based on volume. So uh, I started with this deca tree and I had an IR from wherever uh, that I used for that. And the amount that I would send to that tree was based on just how loud these instruments typically are. So like the trumpets and like trombones, you know, loud instruments, they get a lot of send to that far distant microphone. But then I say, okay, now I'm a mix engineer and I've got that sound, I need to balance it. So I go to the overheads and I say, okay, uh, the trumpets don't really need that much overhead for their sectional microphone. So I'm not gonna turn that up too much. Whereas the woodwinds, they're gonna need quite a lot. So their overhead is, is quite high, whereas their far microphone is quite low. And then after that, I'm like, okay, great. I have the general balance, but some instruments are going to want a little bit more clarity. Um, so I adjusted the dry mix accordingly, because the dry mix is, I guess, as close as uh, you'll get to like a spot microphone. Um, and I did that for the entire orchestra, referencing as much as I could the, uh, the aforementioned L.A. Noir, Heavy Rain, and Star Wars First Assault scores. And uh, that's what I've come up with. And as a result, um, two things happen. One is that uh, it's always balanced. Mm, I don't really get into, and we talked about this, uh, Carl, like I don't really get into situations <laughs> where one instrument is like wildly out of balance from the other because of like, you know, you, you know how it happens. Sometimes you like, you're, you're focused on one thing and you don't realize that you've, you know, whatever. Uh, that can't happen because it's already <laughs> set in stone, the balance. And two, um, if I have an issue where a melody is not coming through or I'm not hearing this background part or whatever, I have to solve it with orchestration. It's the only way to solve any issue now because the volumes are already set and the tone is already set. Um, and I rarely let myself cheat by like automating like the brass section up or whatever, but instead it's like, let's try to solve all of our problems the right way that you would actually have to solve it if this were a live recording 
and in my opinion, that's been a great tool for me to learn just better orchestration practices and, and make sure that it sounds legit. Um, so with that in mind, I'll, I'll now reveal the brass section, which was the most difficult to pull off with this schema, but um, I think it, it, it works pretty well, in my opinion. Um, so let me find a track that actually uses brass. I must apologize. So I've been working on this score for like three years, and my memory of it is not great. You know what? Uh, I got to do this over here so that I'm not. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of music in this score. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, Well, this isn't a very brassy score, but I'll show this piece and just pray that it actually plays because I haven't edited this for my new PC just yet. Uh, hopefully this will work. <laughs> Beautiful. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> How's that for honesty? All right, let's try. like popping noises or is it a little bit yeah well Yeah, that sounds terrible. I apologize, uh, but whatever. So uh, just to talk through this, uh, the way that I have brass organized is uh, the horns are all Hollywood brass, um, pretty standard. Uh, I use the six section for like unison, which is how mostly in my orchestration style it is. But then if I need to do VC, I have the two horns section uh, and then solos as well if I need like three voice um, chords. Uh, and these are all legatos and then staccatos and legatos. The way I sequence for, I'm sorry, there's got to be a better, hold on, I'm, I apologize. I, I just haven't written in this score in a million years. Maybe, um, sorry, just one second. Uh, okay, how about this? Whatever. Anyway, so the way I sequence for horns is I play all three of these articulations at once. Um, so I have this loaded, and so... That sounds bad, right? But once I've recorded that, then I will, um, you know what, let me just give you an example. I'll actually go through the recording and note by note, mute different things that I don't want. So like what I just played there, zoom in. Okay, East West has a bug where, uh, yeah, how about that? This is a wonderful live stream, totally profesh. This is fantastic. Totally what I want to put out into the world as an example of. You're doing great well. Yeah. We love transparency. Yeah. Great. Uh, anyway, so I have all this, right? 
Uh, well, I'll kind of clean this up. These don't need, sorry, let me let you see this. They don't need controllers because it's just staccatos and marcados. Um, individually, it's like that. and then this is the legato. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, let's look at this pattern. I've got some staccatos here, I've got some loud notes, and then I've got some legato stuff there. Uh, I'll take out the, so it's just to refresh how it sounds. Oh yeah, I forgot. Let me just change to a different key so it's not. Hopefully this will fix it. Son of a. Okay. Well, so I'll take the uh, really short notes and I'll take them off of the marcados. And then ditto for the notes that are long and don't have to be like super, super hard attacked. And I'll remove these from the staccato. And then I'll also take off these very quiet legatos. Um, and now. <laughs> So that's how I sequence horns. Um, you can hear it. You can hear it has like sort of like a like an energy to it uh, because I've performed it, you know, number one. And also, whenever it needs that extra attack, I have either the marcado giving it that, which is like okay, medium, or I have the staccato where you really need the uh, onset of the note to really hit hard. Um, delete this and. Uh, so this is Hollywood. That's the more standard uh, of them. But then I also use. Uh, hey, let me maybe if I turn off some effects or something because this is this popping is driving me nuts. So Will, I think it's the sample rate thing. Uh, Zoom is at forty eight, and this session really? appears to be in forty four one. But I don't know if there's possible to just switch the session, the audio settings to four forty eight. It is, but. Who knows what will happen? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Probably a happy accident. Yeah, well, it won't be a happy accident. It'll be a devastating <laughs> one. Um, there is a project file that I really wanted to show you instead of this one, but it's in 48. So maybe at, once my frustration level gets to a certain point, uh, then I can show you that. Oh, actually, maybe during the next thing when I'm talking about my sketching process, I can load it in the background. Uh, but anyways, I use sample modeling for brass. Sample modeling is not typically used for orchestral uh, orchestral music because on its own devices, it would sound like this. Is it just me or is it getting worse and worse the more Well, anyway, that's how it would sound on its own devices. But uh, the way I've mixed it, it now sounds like this. I'm loading the other. I'm going to start off by trying the 48, and then I'm going to load the other, because this is driving me nuts. Can y'all hear me while I uh, while it's doing? Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, it did not work. <laughs> I don't think that it took because it's not. One sec. You know what? I don't. I'm not sure direct sound can do 48, and I kind of need direct sound for. You might increase the buffer size to like 20, 48, the 10, 24 to 20, 48. Yeah. Might do something. Let me go back to 44, 100. Oh, wait, but 
then the zoom thing would still well but it worked before i mean it didn't it didn't do this to any of y'all's music it's yeah 48 should be able to sample 41 yeah well let's see What a touching tribute to unequal sample rates. Yes. Um, I'd like to thank the Academy. No. <laughs> mm, this is taking its sweet time. Mm. Will, do you use this uh, similar orchestral template for a lot of your projects? And how has it evolved over time? Or have you kind of like locked it in a time capsule? Very good question. So um, I started this template, it's in its basic form in like 2013. And every score, I try something new. I, I try some new addition, uh, some different uh, technique that I want to test out. Uh, so for example, on uh, Star Wars Vader, I tried adding in um, saturation to the strings and brass. Uh, and it was a terrible idea. That's the end of that sentence, you know. But, you know, I gave it a whirl. I did it for the whole soundtrack. And, uh, you know, I tried to make it work and I failed. On the current score, um, I have saturation still on the brass. Uh, but on the strings, um, I did an EQ, which I really like. And I think I've reverse ported back into this project. Um, there's this thing that happens with sample libraries over around like 4,700K. For some reason, they all just kind of get muddy there. So if you just dip it like 3 dB, like pretty severely, it just sounds better. I don't understand it, but for some reason it just sounds better. So I, I backported it to this old ass project file. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, they all evolve. Um, different ones have different needs too. Like this one only has like one synth folder that has like everything, right? But uh, man, on Mortal Kombat, it's preposterous. There's like 500 tracks. Well, I guess there's 500 here too, but you know what I mean? There's like way more. And uh, on the current score, it's split into like uh, rhythmic synths, textural synths, basses, and all kinds of stuff like that, FX and transitions. So um, they definitely do evolve, but it's all kind of based on the same kernel. And actually, hey, actually, uh, by the way, before we move on, Hooray! Yeah! Imagine playing with like a one second delay. But anyways, uh, sample modeling uh, for this. And the way this works is I've, uh, like as you can see, I have the dry signal, which I've tamed with, um, oh, well, I guess I brought that in, huh? How about that? Uh, I'll expand that in a sec, but I've tamed this with a uh, pull textile EQ to make it less just buzzy and nasal. Um, and then I used an upward expander. Uh, I, I don't remember putting this in, but my guess is that I listened to um, how the dry signal increases when uh, instruments are playing louder. And so It just gives it some extra buzz. Um, let's see. Then you have the overhead microphones, which sounds like this. And then finally, the distant microphones, which sound like nothing. Let's try again. Come on. Nope. All right. Well, whatever. Trust me. <laughs> One of those works, I guess. This is actually kind of concerning, but whatever. I'm sure it's fine. Oh, it's just oh, whatever. That's what it sounds like. Um, so I have sample modeling for the first chair trumpet. And then for the second and third chairs, it's Hollywood brass. And uh, the first chair trombone. And then the second and third are this patch from Spitfire Albion. Albion has this patch that's like all the horns and all the tenor trombones playing in unison. Um, and so I literally just like 
grabs only the right side and then just stereo narrows it so now it's only trombone and so fairly fairly neat i just liked how how smooth it sounds so when you combine it with the uh the trombone it, it makes for a nice sectional sound and then lastly i have the staccatos which are nice for getting some extra punch um Bass trombone is also sample modeling. And this tuba is from East West Silver, which is a 2003 sample library. But I just thought it sounded pretty good. You know, it's very powerful. And then the my little weird thing that I do is I have a synth tuba that I put into the brass section. And this gives extra punch and it's really buzzy and nasty and huge uh, for when I want like this blah kind of brass section. Um, man, I if we get to a point where I'm talking about um, something else, I'll load up the Mortal Kombat project file because that's much more recent and easier to explain some of these things with. But um, that's kind of what that's all about. Uh, and then lastly, some other, you know, patches here and there. Um, but that's generally how this whole template scheme works. And as far as loading it, uh, so sometimes if I'm starting a new piece, I'll start from like the, an old project file or whatever. And, uh, especially if I'm writing a new piece within, um, the same score, like, as you can see with this, a new soundtrack, this is the entire score, um, all in one file. Uh, and then I just navigate around, like that's, yeah, the whole, dang, four hours, the whole score in one file. And then if I want to navigate around, uh, I can just find stuff here. Uh, but if I'm starting something completely new, uh, I can do a couple things. I can do a project template and let's just hope that this works. It's taking its sweet time. Uh, and start and have all of this, you know, done and ready to go. And like, that's cool, right? It haven't, it hasn't loaded any samples because I want it to be super fast. And it's like, okay, uh, I know this score is only going to use brass or something. So then I'll come here and then uh, I'll bring the effect online and then there's my brass section. Cool. But the other way that I can sometimes do it is uh, piecemeal. So let's say that I wanted to do uh, a score that's nothing but strings. Well, um, no sitting and waiting, yeah. Uh, I can then load this track template for it and just be like, bam, here's my strings. And there it is. And then selectively, once again, uh, once Reaper, come on now. Once again, selectively, I can bring this on if I know that I only need the long, like sustains and legatos, or if I only need the shorts, I can bring that in selectively. Um, so I guess long story short is that uh, Reaper has templates for both entire project files and for individual tracks, which is super useful. Um, and then I use track templates. Well, let's get rid of this. I'll use track templates also for different like uh, design type stuff. So if I want to load in like uh, a synthesizer, I have a track ready for that. I have like a whole hardware series of tracks where I have one track for MIDI that gets loaded and then one for recording that has like a bunch of effects and stuff just ready to go. Um, different drum mixes that I've done and all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's just super, super easy to just, you know, set it and forget it. Uh, and then lastly, for my different sound designs, I'll, oh, okay, don't, I might have like specialized tracks for that. Um, yeah, like here's all a bunch of Mortal Kombat shit. Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, and then lastly, if I'm recording from hardware, I have a whole set of stuff for that. Uh, and I think that's it for the main part of the template. And the last thing that I'll mention uh, by the way, if you're, if you're unfamiliar, this is like Reaper's regioning system, where uh, basically you can think of these all as different, um, different cues. 
And if I want to render like a bunch of queues at once, I can do that. If I want to stem render, I can do that uh, because there's like a render matrix. So uh, here we go. So it's like, I want to render this queue, this region, but I only want to hear this track from that region. Well, you can just select it and then it'll come out in your render. And you can multi-render as much as you want and as deeply as you want. Uh, which is really cool. Um, what I also wanted to show, though, was at the very top. So the way that I like to work when I'm doing like a whole project file in one in one go is I will ride two different folders. One is the volume balance folder, and this is like balancing the volumes of different tracks across the score. So this is just you know volume automation like oh this this piece is too quiet let me turn it up and such and then also uh oh oh dear well whatever I'll just keep talking uh, this is uh, reverb that I have on top of the full orchestra that's in addition to those IRs that I mentioned um, and its place is to give like the final um, sense of depth and so I'll automate that for just a general like wetness dryness for the mix as a whole um there you go so like if i'm doing a ambient track like whatever the hell this is oh the front oh this is a cool one maybe i'll turn it way up but for an action piece then i'll turn it down much lower In this final volume balance track, I won't turn it on because I'm afraid, but this has the, my last and final reverb, which I have high pass filtered so that it's just giving some high end air. I have bass management with this plugin. Uh, some, uh, I don't know what that's all about. Oh, it's bypassed. Uh, okay, so this is just uh, a little bit of cleaning up of the mix as a whole. And then finally, some tape saturation for just a nice uh, glue. And this is basically what I call a pre-master folder. Everything roots into this, routes into this, whatever. Um, and my actual master track, wherever that is, why can't I find, I press the thing. Uh, my actual master track has no coloring effects at all. It just has the limiter. Uh, and I use a very transparent, this is free actually, by the way, this is the most transparent limiter I've ever used and it's free. Isn't that crazy? PC. But um, yeah, it, all it does is embiggen the volume. It doesn't do any coloring, anything like that, because I don't want the master bus to change the sound. I want to be able to preview it just from here. Um, so that's that. And uh, lastly, I have a bunch of reverbs. Like these are more like special effects reverbs. Uh, and I just keep them up here so that if I want to add some reverb to like something I've recorded off of a synthesizer or something, uh, I can just send it out there uh, outside of the folder tracks so that it's just easy and I don't have to have like 70 different reverbs. Um, that's about it for the project template. Any questions on this so far or? No? OK. So uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, was my orchestration and sketching process, uh, which I try to be as, as disciplined as I can, because um, honestly, putting stuff into DAWs I find to be extraordinarily boring. And I want to just get all of my ideas out and, and set in stone before I waste time you know, putting something into a DAW. Um, so like I mentioned, it's all on paper first, usually. Uh, and once I have it on paper, then I can say, OK, uh, I need to make sure that this works as a piece of music, that it flows properly, that different sections have the right amount of time dedicated to them. And so that's why I often will do piano sketches, uh, literally like, like on the piano uh, track. And then once I have that, then I can listen to it and I can just say, okay, well, let's hear this and we'll hear it for the whole duration and I'll be able to tell, oh, okay, this measure here should really be four measures, this thing here, whatever. And once I'm happy with that, 
then I'll go and replace the piano tracks with the real orchestration and, and all that uh, so that it's not, um, you know, I just don't want to waste time having to like add a section of music to something that's already been orchestrated because that's kind of a pain. Um, but that's, that's basically how I go about it. Um, I think that maybe we can, because uh, I, I want to get out of this a new project and show the Mortal Kombat one because that's a little bit of a better example um, for the Reaper side of stuff. But uh, if there's any um, other questions uh, about uh, any of this, then uh, now is the time because I'm about to close this. I just have sort of a um, general question. What synths do you uh, usually use? Yeah, um, I'll start with the software and then I'll show you the hardware. So in software, mostly I use Zebra HZ and Serum. Uh, Zebra HZ is great because, oh, well, neither of these are going to be here. So, womp womp. But uh, Zebra H, oh, I guess so. The reason I like it is that it can be very organic. Um, it's highly modular. It's got the worst UI I've ever seen in my entire life. But like once you kind of get past that, um, it, it's, it's, it's very powerful. And it just sounds good. You know, it's got like a really nice, warm, like sort of Roland Juno type tone. Uh, and you can customize it in all kinds of different ways. And there's all sorts of effects and stuff that are really cool. Uh, Serum is wavetable synthesis. And uh, it's what I use for just, you know, the more weird kind of stuff. I'm kind of used more in like little blippy synths. For this score, I use a lot of Silent One because uh, I'm trying to get like a 70s style synthesizer sound for it. And that sort of gets that sound for me a little bit better than any of the others. Uh, it's also the first synth that I started, of, of the ones I still use, the first one. So that's why it's in this six-year-old project file or whatever. Um, let's see. I think that's it for this project. Uh, in other words, I've, start, I've started using a lot of FM8 uh, to get a lot of that kind of like FM grit to it, as well as... Um, Sometimes I use Razor, which is like a reactor library, but it's a little bit just unstable, so I don't use it too much. And in fact, usually I'll just sample from Razor. Like once I make a patch that I like, I'll just sample it and use that instead, which I think I've done here actually somewhere or not. Well, whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, oftentimes, instead of using like an actual synth, I'll just do some sound design and then sample it. Uh, so this is a crying baby. And this is a crying baby. You know how like when babies cry, their pitch kind of goes all over. So this is a, a different part of the sample where the pitch is going down. What I like to do uh, with samples like this that don't really have a nice, like, even pitch throughout is I'll just tune them to um, uh, 10 tet. So it's not, it's not perfect, like, um, uh, equal temperament, but it's in, like, some other division so that you can always get these interesting, interesting sort of, like, clusters and whatnot. Uh, I use a lot of Paul stretch. So, like, here's just the piano. like a music box I took a, a full orchestra staccato playing very quietly uh, and for some reason when you slow it down to like 3600% it sounds like this moments in this score uh if i can find it oh boy this i apologize hopefully this will work no that's not it it's uh 
No, that's not it either. One of the great things about video games is that uh, we change the names of shit like all the time. So I think this is the city or maybe the fortress. Well, we'll find out. We'll find out together if this is the right track. Nope. Reaper's just going to do a thing, huh? Anyway, I do a lot of sound design. <laughs> you change the name of things, but you can't change the file name. It. It's like early in the project, it was called the city, and now it's called the fortress. You know, the only purpose to that was to make me look like an idiot on live stream in front of the entire internet. So, uh, how's it going, internet? Oh, great. Okay. Well, let's try this one more time. Oh, come on. Are you serious? <laughs> what the hell? This is crazy. I've not, this is, okay, so teachable moment, uh, use ASIO if you can. We had to switch it to direct sound because of Zoom. Uh, Discord did not have this problem, by the way, just saying. But for some reason in Zoom, you have to use direct sound and it's, yeah. Trust me, I don't write like this, having to wait 20 minutes just to hit play. some of the hardware stuff I'm using. Uh, so that used a lot of that like orchestra pad uh, and then some other synths and whatnot. Um, let's see. So as far as hardware, this is the first one that I bought. I don't mind this. This is the first one that I got, which is a Moog sub fatty. And uh, I love it for doubling with the low strings and doing kind of like very simple sorts of uh, synth arps, sub basses, drones. It's amazing for drones. Um, I also have the MS-20, which was like basically the sound of Mortal Kombat 11. Like this is how I got a lot of the, oh, I can actually just play these. This is how I got a lot of like the growls and uh, really nasty kind of sounds uh, out of that. What's this? Oh, okay. uh, I also have the Arturia um, Mini Brute 2S, uh, which is, it's got a nice, like, sort of powerful, thick bass. And it's good for bass lines because it's got a sequencer in here, so I can use that. Uh, and also, it's semi modular, so you can do all kinds of weird stuff. Um, I like to root it through this drive pedal. This is a Moog MF drive, which unfortunately is out of. Um, uh, they don't sell them anymore, but uh, you can uh, you can root like an LFO from anything into the expression pedal slot here, and then you can do some really cool stuff with that, or like envelope it, or whatever you want. And it's got a really nice drive circuit as well. Uh, rounding it out is a Korg Mini Log. This is basically the synth that like every hip hop producer has for some reason. But it's actually really, really cool. I, I love the way that, um, I mean, it's, it's four voice polyphonic, but it's also analog, which is great considering the price. And it's got really cool um, preset functions where like you can have, uh, there's a word for that, microtonal, is that what it's called? When it's not like equal temperament, whatever. You can do that in this very easily, uh, which I really love. And then back here, maybe I'll turn on another light. So it's visible. 
I have a GK350 uh, base amp, uh, which is super, super cool running, running synths through there. Uh, it has an overdrive, but I really like just running it through the main, uh, the main circuit of the amp because uh, it can really add a lot of nice clean power to an uh, otherwise tiny synthesizer. Like, for example, I've got these neat little Korg toy synthesizers. These are actually fully analog circuits. Um, in fact, this uses the same filter as the MS-20. Uh, so you can get some really nice kind of growling type sounds with it. Right now, it obviously sounds a little whack. But, but yeah, it's really cool for that kind of stuff. And then this one is the same thing, but it has an analog delay, uh, which is super cool. Uh, if it works, which it does not. So how about that? Well, there we go. So it's really neat. And they both have inputs. So you can uh, like input from a synth into this. You can input from a giant bass amp into this and you can do whatever, whatever you like. And lastly, rounding it off, I have a couple pedals. Um, I mentioned this one. This is a delay pedal. And then this is like a multi-effect. Uh, this is the one that pretty much everyone on every synth forum has, because uh, it's got every effect you can possibly imagine, really. Um, Yeah, the sub fatty is great for those sort of like really meaty, beefy kinds of kinds of sounds. And yeah. Oh, I forgot. My current favorite one, which my little brother is sitting on right now, is the Volca drum. Uh, I never used uh, drum machines before uh, buying this thing, and it looks like a little toy, but it's got a really powerful sound once you actually you know plug it in. Uh, and run it through some effects and stuff. Uh, it can really, really get get a great tone. I'm I'm using this all over my current uh, score, not a new, but the other current score that I can't talk about. Um, it's all digital, but what's neat about it is that uh, yeah, grabs a friend like that. Uh, what's neat about it is that it's physical modeling. It's not like it's not using samples at all. So you can make it sound like anything that you want. Like you know, here's like a standard drum sound, right? Fairly obvious, but I've also got stuff like this. Which is like, you know, you wouldn't really expect that, but, um, you know, and everything in between. Uh, so yeah, it's really, really neat for getting interesting ideas. You can just kind of play around with it uh, and come up with whatever you want. Um, and it works really well. It's also stereo, surprisingly. So it works really well with stereo effects pedals like this, or if you want to just do your effects on a PC and whatnot. Um, let's see. Uh, were there any other questions about the, like the orchestration or sketching process or anything like that? Um, kind of slightly a tangent, but I know just we had the conversation before of like it's flute players like oh yeah doubling like your flute melodies with the violin line is like a thing to do. So just do you have any of those like habits that you tend to like go into or doublings you particularly like unique things that you like to pair together? Hmm. Um, you know what, before I answer that, I'm gonna try to open up the MK project because this is a bad, everything I do on this game is like intentionally weird and not gonna be super helpful to any conversation that I have. Um, but on MK, it's more, uh, more standard. So let me just get this going and then let's do like, where's the actual, okay. Yeah, that's, that's probably it. No. All right. Hopefully that works and that'll just in the background. Yes. Um, like, like I mentioned, uh, if you're trying to have like that really sweeping epic high string sound. It's really cool to double the high strings with a sectional um, winds patch. And uh, doubling with solos, I, I can't really recommend that in in you know samples because 
it just it just doesn't really quite sound right. And it especially doesn't sound right if you're like trying to double multiple solos to make a chord. That sounds like extremely wrong. Um, unless you're using Berlin woodwinds, if you feel like paying $2,000 or however much that costs. And that's like far and away the best wind library that exists. Um, a lot of work to get it to sound right, but uh, it's super good. I don't use it personally because uh, you don't really, I'm sorry, you don't really hear woodwinds that well. So it's like not necessarily worth the gigabytes and the money, but nonetheless, um, that works super well. Uh, I actually, and this is kind of an unusual one, I think of the low woodwind section as part of the brass section. In fact, I actually think of the high winds as part of the brass too. Like I, I find myself doubling trumpets with really high piccolo and flutes more often than, and then oboes at pitch if I feel like it, more often than I have the high winds doubling the strings. Um, my reasoning for this actually is uh, because of trends in recording technology. I feel like recording is so good now that you don't really need to double the strings. Like it's more about color rather than just the need to amplify or anything like that. Um, so I don't really do that anymore. Uh, the only times I would ever do it is if I want to add more like of the color of one particular wind section or like the vibrato being wider than a string section would have or something like that. Um, but otherwise, I don't really double for that reason. Um, whereas with the brass sections, uh, for example, if I double the uh, low brass with contra bassoons and bass clarinets and whatnot, uh, it gives this really thick organish tone that amplifies the fundamental even more. So it gives like a much clearer bit, especially obviously if you're using the winds as as octaves rather than filling in pitches. I know that the um, classical mentality is more like, hey, here's your low strings, but you're not allowed to use those intervals. So use bassoons to fill in the, you know, whatever. Um, you know, that works too. But uh, nowadays, recording technology is so great that you don't really need to worry about that unless you're doing something totally ridiculous. Um, and then by extension, like I mentioned, I like my samples to follow the same restrictions that uh, live recordings have. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I, how I deal with that. Let us hope that this project file actually works because, oh boy. <laughs> Uh, solo. And while we're hoping and praying, if anyone has any other questions, then feel free to chime in. Um, yeah, they will. Um, hey. Yeah, I, I was just kind of curious about like other, um, you kind of mentioned like you um, have like uh, your synth sound that doubles the tuba and stuff like that and um mm -hmm. i was kind of curious about like any other kind of um like synth uh doubling or backing up or, or things like that like that you might commonly do you know like yeah, yeah yeah so uh i played that one patch on i'd like to mention that i hit play before you ask that question that's how long it took you enjoyed that horn line because it took anyway um uh what i like to do is to double low strings with the moog sub fatty i have this one uh patch here which hopefully can play without uh it going crazy but i have this one patch that i design and i use all the time that's really good for sub bass type stuff And you put this underneath the double basses. It just gives such a nice, like warm kind of, you know, Hans Zimmer uh, theater bass. Um, I don't do it all the time. I definitely don't do it all the time. It's actually quite rare that I put that in. But when I really need that really warm, quiet, but just fill up the whole soundscape bass, uh, then I'll reach for this. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> another silly one that I. I wonder if this will play. Um, another silly one that I have though in this score is, you know how like that that sort of wah kind of sound that is is quite popular now. 
Well, I do a lot of that with the MS-20. And uh, I, yeah, I think it's just the MS-20 with um, uh, trombones uh, at pitch. And I just turned the peak up super high on the MS-20. And in six to 12 weeks, uh, you'll hear the music playing because I hit play like long before I started talking. But um, heard any good haikus lately? Uh, <laughs> Mantis green and strong, deadly pincers, razor sharp, waiting for his chance. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? This will interrupt us at some point. Yeah. Well, we had a question from online uh, before we log off there. Um, just kind of. Profesh. So profesh. Yes. Uh, what was the online question? <laughs> I got horned. Um, yeah. How would you say that like working on these different scores from like Mortal Kombat or WW2 Call of Duty? Um, how, are, how are those projects different or as you're like working on more projects that are larger triple a games like how, how have your workflows changed or just like your experience of working in the video game mm -hmm. audio industry yeah i mean if you're comparing like uh mortal Kombat to call of duty they were very 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 different in in how my relationships with the client how we work together um you know on on call of duty it's like what a billion dollars is at stake and there's like three companies involved because it wasn't just Sledgehammer, but it was also Activision, the publisher, and then the Sony music team kind of uh, handled the music supervision and implementation and editing and whatnot. Um, so yeah, everything had to kind of go through this ridiculous gauntlet. And sometimes I would get like the main theme, I got like a two pages, single spaced 10 point font on just revision notes. Yeah, it, it was like, and that was after, that was from getting from revision four to revision five. So we'd already, it, it was ridiculous. And um, that's kind of what you would expect for something that's of that nature. Uh, but the funny thing is on MK, I, I can count on like one hand the number of revisions that I had to do for Mortal Kombat 11. And it all has to do with um, the personnel involved and, and you know, the people who have different stakes. I mean, obviously on Call of Duty, it was, you know, quite political. But in Mortal Kombat, the audio director is actually a composer himself. He did a lot of the uh, PlayStation 2 Mortal Kombat scores and quite brilliantly actually and he's been working there for like a million and a half years so his philosophy is look we got a new composer for a reason let's just let him do his thing we made a you know we hopefully made the right choice of whom to hire and then we let them kind of go off and my perspective on it is that I'd loved Mortal Kombat for like 25 years and even though obviously I never thought that I would ever get to score it, I know these characters like the back of my hand. And so um, these different light motive ideas and signature sound ideas kind of came to me and it kind of became a game of like surprising them, like giving them something that they might not have expected, but that totally works for the characters in the scene. Um, so that's how that relationship was. Whereas with Call of Duty, it was more, um, it was more like, you have to walk this tight rope between you can't be too much of this you can't be too this you know not too modern but also not too traditional and like how do you get exactly in the middle whereas mk was just throw everything in uh and you know see what see what happens and just have fun with it um comparing the triple a scores with the more indie work that i've done though um i mean again it just kind of varies from project to project like on a new the the previous thing that i showed you um in that case the the score um what do you call it temp tracks they didn't send me anything from like a movie or or from other video games or anything like that at all all the temp like reference music was from 20th century art music it was all like uh Ratavara, john adams bartok um and they really wanted something that was kind of fresh and and sort of different so I took those influences and then I added a pretty healthy dose of like JBC and um, a lot of sort of 1970s style synthesizer. Because if you look at the art style, it kind of has this sort of retro sort of weird vibe to it. Like what, what people from the 1970s thought the future would look like. That's kind of what the game looks like. Uh, so I added a lot of that and kind of put it in the blender and 
give it a shot. And I don't think I've really, I've actually never had a creative revision request on that on that score, if I remember correctly. It's always just been like little technical things like, oh, we need this to be split into two tracks and things like that. But um, I think that's usually the difference is that when the stakes are really high, um, that's when you're going to see more stakeholders. Uh, you might be in the unfortunate circumstance of having multiple people kind of tell you different things because they each want it to be going their way. But, you know, then you have to kind of find a middle ground and all that. Um, you also end up doing less the more, you know, blockbustery, I guess, the score is. And this isn't something that I'm super happy about, but it's just the reality. Like, I haven't really been able to implement the scores on my own since, I think, Dead Island, uh, Dead Island 2, uh, which is kind of a shame because I love, you know, working that close to the metal. But um, it just doesn't really, you know, when, when the, the deadlines are that short and, you know, the revisions are like that extensive and you're just busy with so many things. And these days I'm usually working on at least two projects at a time. Um, it's just not really feasible. Plus, they already usually have in-house teams who handle the implementation and the mixing and, and whatnot. Um, so you kind of take on less and less responsibilities as things go higher. But I will say that it is good to know um, how to implement, how to mix, how to edit, and all that kind of stuff. Because uh, how to orchestrate. I mean, when, I, I orchestrated for MK, but normally I don't have the time to do that. So I work with um, external orchestrators. Um, but it's it's really good that I know how to orchestrate on my own because then I can take their work and make sure that it's exactly how I would have wanted to do it. Um, plus, of course, their own creativity, um, making sure that uh, their creativity comes through as well. Um, but yeah, the, the, the larger projects, I guess the downside is that you're a little bit more removed uh, from the final product. Uh, the upside is resources though. I mean, you know, with Call of Duty, we had a full orchestra. Uh, Mortal Kombat, we had the orchestra for the main theme. Uh, and also for both of those projects, I got to record a sample library. Um, both of them, they have orchestral effects sample libraries that I tacked on at the very end uh, and have been super useful. Um, and it's things like, oh, I don't, you know what, I doubt that this will be in here now that I'm thinking about well, it. Well, I just want to take a moment to... Oh. Uh... Thank you for sharing and uh, also thank our online viewers for watching. Um, students, please stick around. And um, for anybody who's watching, uh, we'd like to invite you to stay tuned. At 5 p.m. we have a, a Tiny Dorm concert starting. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll see you next week for another Tech Online Masterclass. Ciao.